Chapter Four, Part A of Sons and Lovers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Sons and Lovers, by D. H. Lawrence, Chapter Four, The Young Life of Paul. Paul would be built like his mother, slightly and rather small. His fair hair went reddish, and then dark brown. His eyes were grey. He was a pale, quiet child, with eyes that seemed to listen, and with a full, dropping under lip. As a rule he seemed old for his years. He was so conscious of what other people felt, particularly his mother. When she fretted he understood, and could have no peace. His soul seemed always attentive to her. As he grew older he became stronger. William was too far removed from him to accept him as a companion, so the smaller boy belonged at first almost entirely to Annie. She was a tomboy, and a flyby skyby as her mother called her, but she was intensely fond of her second brother. So Paul was towed round at the heels of Annie, sharing her game. She raced wildly at Lurkey with the other young wildcats of the bottoms, and always Paul flew beside her, living her share of the game having as yet no part of his own. He was quiet and not noticeable, but his sister adored him. He always seemed to care for things if she wanted him to. She had a big doll of which she was fearfully proud, though not so fond. So she laid the doll on the sofa and covered it with an antimacassar to sleep. Then she forgot it. Meantime Paul must practice jumping off the sofa arm. So he jumped crash into the face of the hidden doll. Annie rushed up, uttered a loud wail, and sat down to weep a dirge. Paul remained quite still. "'You couldn't tell it was there, mother. You couldn't tell it was there,' he repeated over and over. So long as Annie wept for the doll, he sat helpless with misery. Her grief wore itself out. She forgave her brother. He was so much upset." But a day or two afterwards she was shocked. "'Let's make a sacrifice of Arabella,' he said. "'Let's burn her!' She was horrified, yet rather fascinated. She wanted to see what the boy would do. He made an altar of bricks, pulled some of the shavings out of Arabella's body, put the waxen fragments into the hollow face, poured on a little paraffin, and set the whole thing alight. He watched with wicked satisfaction the drops of wax melt off the broken forehead of Arabella, and drop like sweat into the flame. So long as the stupid big doll burned, he rejoiced in silence. At the end he poked among the embers with a stick, fished out the arms and legs, all blackened, and smashed them under stones. "'That's the sacrifice of Mrs. Arabella,' he said, "'and I'm glad there's nothing left of her.' which disturbed Annie inwardly, although she could say nothing. He seemed to hate the doll so intensely, because he had broken it. All the children, but particularly Paul, were peculiarly against their father, along with their mother. Morel continued to bully and to drink. He had periods, months at a time, when he made the whole life of the family a misery. Paul never forgot coming home from the Band of Hope one Monday evening, and finding his mother with her eyes swollen and discoloured, his father standing on the hearth-rug, feet astride, his head down, and William, just home from work, glaring at his father. There was a silence as the young children entered, but none of the elders looked round. William was white to the lips, and his fists were clenched. He waited until the children were silent, watching with children's rage and hate. Then he said, you coward! You daren't do it when I was in!" But Morel's blood was up. He swung round on his son. William was bigger, but Morel was hard-muscled and mad with fury. "'Doesn't I!' he shouted. "'Doesn't I! How much more of thy chelp, my young jockey, and I'll rattle my fist about thee! Aye, and I show that, dost see?' Morel crouched at the knees and showed his fist in an ugly, almost beast-like fashion. William was white with rage. "'Will yer?' 
he said, quiet and intense. It'd be the last time, though. Morel danced a little nearer, crouching, drawing back his fist to strike. William put his fists ready. A light came into his blue eyes, almost like a laugh. He watched his father. Another word, and the men would have begun to fight. Paul hoped they would. The three children sat pale on the sofa. "'Stop it, both of you!' cried Mrs. Morel in a hard voice. "'We've had enough for one night. And you,' she said, turning on to her husband, "'look at your children!' Morel glanced at the sofa. "'Look at the children, you nasty little bitch!' he sneered. "'Why, what have I done to the children, I should like to know? But they're like yourself. You've put them up to your own tricks and nasty ways. You've learned them in it, you have?' She refused to answer him. No one spoke. After a while he threw his boots under the table and went to bed. "'Why didn't you let me have a go at him?' said William, when his father was upstairs. I could easily have beaten him. "'A nice thing, your own father,' she replied. "'Father,' repeated William, "'call him my father.' "'Well, he is, and so. But why don't you let me settle him? I could do easily.' "'The idea,' she cried. "'It hasn't come to that yet.' "'No,' he said. It's come to worse. Look at yourself. Why didn't you let me give it him? Because I couldn't bear it, so never think of it, she cried quickly. And the children went to bed, miserably. When William was growing up, the family moved from the bottoms to a house on the brow of the hill, commanding a view of the valley, which spread out like a convex cockle-shell or a clamp-shell before it. In front of the house was a huge old ash-tree. The west wind, sweeping from Derbyshire, caught the houses with full force, and the tree shrieked again. Morel liked it. "'It's music,' he said. "'It sends me to sleep.' But Paul and Arthur and Annie hated it. To Paul it became almost a demoniacal noise. The winter of their first year in the new house their father was very bad. The children played in the street, on the brim of the wide, dark valley, until eight o'clock. Then they went to bed. Their mother sat sewing below. Having such a great space in front of the house gave the children a feeling of night, of vastness, and of terror. This terror came in from the shrieking of the tree and the anguish of the home discord. Often Paul would wake up, after he had been asleep a long time, aware of thuds downstairs. Instantly he was wide awake. Then he heard the booming shouts of his father, come home nearly drunk, then the sharp replies of his mother, then the bang-bang of his father's fist on the table, and the nasty snarling shout as the man's voice got higher. And then the whole was drowned in a piercing medley of shrieks and cries from the great wind-swept ash-tree. The children lay silent in suspense waiting for a lull in the wind to hear what their father was doing. He might hit their mother again. There was a feeling of horror, a kind of bristling in the darkness, and a sense of blood. They lay with their hearts in the grip of an intense anguish. The wind came through the tree fiercer and fiercer. All the chords of the great harp hummed, whistled, and shrieked. And then came the horror of the sudden silence, silence everywhere outside and downstairs. What was it? Was it a silence of blood? What had he done? The children lay and breathed the darkness, and then at last they heard their father throw down his boots and tramp upstairs in his stockinged feet. Still they listened. Then at last, if the wind allowed, they heard the water of the tap drumming into the kettle, which their mother was filling for morning and they could go to sleep in peace. So they were happy in the morning, happy, very happy playing, dancing at night round the lonely lamp-post in the midst of the darkness. But they had one tight place of anxiety in their hearts, one darkness in their eyes, which showed all their lives. Paul hated his father. As a boy he had a fervent private religion. 
"'Make him stop drinking,' he prayed every night. "'Lord, let my father die,' he prayed very often. "'Let him not be killed at pit,' he prayed when, after tea, the father did not come home from work. That was another time when the family suffered intensely. The children came from school and had their teas. On the hob the big black saucepan was simmering. The stew-jar was in the oven, ready for Morel's dinner. He was expected at five o'clock. But for months he would stop and drink every night on his way from work. In the winter nights, when it was cold and grew dark early, Mrs. Morel would put a brass candlestick on the table, light a tallow candle to save the gas. The children finished their bread and butter, or dripping, and were ready to go out to play. But if Morel had not come home, they faltered. The sense of his sitting in all his pit dirt, drinking, after a long day's work, not coming home and eating and washing, but sitting, getting drunk, on an empty stomach, made Mrs. Morel unable to bear herself. From her the feeling was transmitted to the other children. She never suffered alone any more. The children suffered with her. Paul went out to play with the rest. Down in the great trough of twilight, tiny clusters of lights burned where the pits were. A few last colliers straggled up the dim field path. The lamplighter came along. No more colliers came. Darkness shut down over the valley. Work was done. It was night. Then Paul ran anxiously into the kitchen. The one candle still burned on the table. The big fire glowed red. Mrs. Morel sat alone. On the hob the saucepan steamed. The dinner plate lay waiting on the table. All the room was full of the sense of waiting. Waiting for the man who was sitting in his pit dirt, dinnerless, some mile away from home, across the darkness, drinking himself drunk. Paul stood in the doorway. "'Has my dad come?' he asked. "'You can see he hasn't,' said Mrs. Morel, cross with the futility of the question. Then the boy dawdled about near his mother. They shared the same anxiety. Presently Mrs. Morel went out and strained the potatoes. "'They're ruined and black,' she said. "'But what do I care?' Not many words were spoken. Paul almost hated his mother for suffering because his father did not come home from work. "'What do you bother yourself for?' he said. "'If he wants to stop and get drunk, why don't you let him?' "'Let him!' flashed Mrs. Morel. "'You may well say, let him!' She knew that the man who stops on the way home from work is on a quick way to ruining himself and his home. The children were yet young, and depended on the breadwinner. William gave her the sense of relief, providing her at last with someone to turn to if Morel failed. But the tense atmosphere of the room on these waiting evenings was the same. The minutes ticked by. At six o'clock still the cloth lay on the table, still the dinner stood waiting, still the same sense of anxiety and expectation in the room. The boy could not stand it any longer. He could not go out and play. So he ran in to Mrs. Inger, next door but one, for her to talk to him. She had no children. Her husband was good to her, but was in a shop and came home late. So when she saw the lad at the door, she called, "'Come in, Paul!' The two sat talking for some time, when suddenly the boy rose, saying, "'Well, I'll be going and seeing if my mother wants an errand doing.' He pretended to be perfectly cheerful and did not tell his friend what ailed him. Then he ran indoors. Morel at these times came in churlish and hateful. "'This is a nice time to come home,' said Mrs. Morel. "'What's it matter to you what time I come home?' he shouted. And everybody in the house was still, because he was dangerous. He ate his food in the most brutal manner possible and when he had done, pushed all the pots in a heap away from him, to lay his arms on the table. Then he went to sleep. Paul hated his father so. The collier's small, mean head, with its black hair slightly soiled with grey, lay on the bare arms, and the face, 
dirty and inflamed, with a fleshy nose and thin, paltry brows, was turned sideways, asleep with beer and weariness and nasty temper. If any one entered suddenly, or a noise were made, the man looked up and shouted, "'I'll lay my fist about your head, I'm telling thee, if that does not stop that clatter. Dost hear?' And the last two words, shouted in a bullying fashion, usually at Annie, made the family writhe with hate of the man. He was shut out from all family affairs. No one told him anything. The children, alone with their mother, told her all about the day's happenings, everything. Nothing had really taken place in them until it was told to their mother. But as soon as the father came in, everything stopped. He was like the scotch in the smooth, happy machinery of the home. But he was always aware of this fall of silence on his entry, the shutting off of life, the unwelcome. But now it was gone too far to alter. He would dearly have liked the children to talk to him, but they could not. Sometimes Mrs. Morrill would say, "'You ought to tell your father.' Paul won a prize in a competition in a child's paper. Everybody was highly jubilant. "'Now you'd better tell your father when he comes in,' said Mrs. Morrill. "'You know how he carries on and says he's never told anything.' "'All right,' said Paul. But he would almost rather have forfeited the prize than have to tell his father. "'I've won a prize in a competition, Dad,' he said. Morrill turned round to him. "'Have you, my boy? What sort of competition?' "'Oh, nothing. About famous women.' "'And how much is the prize, then, as you've got?' "'It's a book.' "'Oh, indeed. About birds.' "'Hm, hm.' And that was all. Conversation was impossible between the father and any other member of the family. He was an outsider. He had denied the God in him. The only times when he entered again into the life of his own people was when he worked, and was happy at work. Sometimes, in the evening, he cobbled the boots, or mended the kettle, or his pit-bottle. Then he always wanted several attendants, and the children enjoyed it. They united with him in the work, in the actual doing of something, when he was his real self again. He was a good workman, dexterous, and one who, when he was in a good humour, always sang. He had whole periods, months, almost years, of friction and nasty temper. Then sometimes he was jolly again. It was nice to see him run with a piece of red-hot iron into the scullery, crying, "'Out of my road! Out of my road!' Then he hammered the soft, red-glowing stuff on his iron goose, and made the shape he wanted. Or he sat absorbed for a moment, soldering. Then the children watched with joy as the metal sank suddenly molten, and was shoved about against the nose of the soldering iron, while the room was full of a scent of burnt resin and hot tin, and Morrill was silent and intent for a minute. He always sang when he mended boots, because of the jolly sound of hammering, and he was rather happy when he sat putting great patches on his moleskin pit-trousers, which he would often do, considering them too dirty, and the stuff too hard for his wife to mend. But the best time for the young children was when he made fuses. Morrill fetched a sheaf of long, sound wheat straws from the attic. These he cleaned with his hand, till each one gleamed like a stalk of gold, after which he cut the straws into lengths of about six inches, leaving, if he could, a notch at the bottom of each piece. He always had a beautifully sharp knife that could cut a straw clean without hurting it, then he set in the middle of the table a heap of gunpowder, a little pile of black grains upon the white scrubbed board. He made and trimmed the straws while Paul and Annie rifled and plugged them. Paul loved to see the black grains trickle down a crack in his palm into the mouth of the straw, peppering jollily downwards till the straw was full. Then he bunged up the mouth with a bit of soap, which he got on his thumbnail from a pat in a saucer, and the straw was finished. "'Look, Dad,' he said. "'That's right, my beauty,' replied Morrill, who was particularly lavish of endearments to his second son. Paul popped the fuse into the powder-tin, ready for the morning, 
when Morrill would take it to the pit and use it to fire a shot that would blast the coal down. Meantime Arthur, still fond of his father, would lean on the arm of Morrill's chair and say, "'Tell us about down pit, Daddy!' This Morrill loved to do. "'Well, there's one little hoss. We call him Taffy,' he would begin. "'And he's a fossin. Morrill had a warm way of telling a story. He made one feel Taffy's cunning. "'He's a brownin,' he would answer, "'and not very high. Well, he come in the stall with a rattle, and then you hear him sneeze. "'Hello, Taff,' you say. "'What art sneezin' for? Been takin' some snuff?' "'And he sneezes again. Then he slives up and shoves his head on yer, that Caden. "'What's that, Taff?' you say. "'And what does he?' Arthur always asked. "'He wants a bit of backer, my ducky.' This story of Taffy would go on interminably, and everybody loved it. Or sometimes it was a new tale. "'And what dost think, my darling? When I went to put my coat on at snap-time, what should go running up my arm but a mouse? "'Hey, up there!' I shouts and I were just in time to get him by the tail. "'And did you kill it?' "'I did, for they're a nuisance. The place is fair snide with them. "'And what do they live on?' "'The corn is the osses drop, and they'll get in your pocket and eat your snap if you let em. No matter where you hang your coat, the slivin' nibblin' little nuisances, for they are.' These happy evenings could not take place unless Morrill had some job to do, and then he always went to bed very early, often before the children. There was nothing remaining for him to stay up for, when he had finished tinkering, and had skimmed the headlines of the newspaper. And the children felt secure when their father was in bed. They lay and talked softly a while. Then they started as the lights went suddenly sprawling over the ceiling from the lamps that swung in the hands of the colliers, tramping by outside, going to take the nine o'clock shift. They listened to the voices of the men, imagined them dipping down into the dark valley. Sometimes they went to the window and watched the three or four lamps growing tinier and tinier, swaying down the fields in the blackness. Then it was a joy to rush back to bed and cuddle closely in the warmth. Paul was a rather delicate boy, subject to bronchitis. The others were all quite strong, so this was another reason for his mother's difference in feeling for him. One day he came home at dinner-time feeling ill, but it was not a family to make any fuss. "'What's the matter with you?' his mother asked sharply. "'Nothing,' he replied. But he ate no dinner. "'If you eat no dinner you're not going to school,' she said. "'Why?' he asked. That's why. So after dinner he lay down on the sofa, on the warm chintz cushions the children loved. Then he fell into a kind of doze. That afternoon Mrs. Morrill was ironing. She listened to the small restless noise the boy made in his throat as she worked. Again rose in her heart the old, almost weary feeling towards him. She had never expected him to live and yet he had a great vitality in his young body. Perhaps it would have been a little relief to her if he had died. She always felt a mixture of anguish in her love for him. He, in his semi-conscious sleep, was vaguely aware of the clatter of the iron on the iron stand, of the faint thud, thud on the ironing board. Once roused, he opened his eyes to see his mother standing on the hearth-rug with the hot iron near her cheek, listening, as it were, to the heat. Her still face, with the mouth closed tight from suffering and disillusion and self-denial, and her nose the smallest bit on one side, and her blue eyes so young, quick, and warm, made his heart contract with love. When she was quiet, so, she looked brave and rich with life, but as if she had been done out of her rights. It hurt the boy keenly, this feeling about her that she had never had her life's fulfilment, and his own incapability to make up to her hurt him with a sense of impotence, yet made him patiently dogged inside. It was his childish aim. 
She spat on the iron, and the little ball of spit bounded, raced off the dark, glossy surface. Then, kneeling, she rubbed the iron on the sack lining of the hearth-rug vigorously. She was warm in the ruddy firelight. Paul loved the way she crouched and put her head on one side. Her movements were light and quick. It was always a pleasure to watch her. Nothing she ever did, no movement she ever made, could have been found fault with by her children. The room was warm and full of the scent of hot linen. Later on the clergyman came and talked softly with her. Paul was laid up with an attack of bronchitis. He did not mind much. What happened, happened, and it was no good kicking against the pricks. He loved the evenings, after eight o'clock, when the light was put out, and he could watch the fire-flames spring over the darkness of the walls and ceiling, could watch huge shadows waving and tossing, till the room seemed full of men who battled silently. On retiring to bed, the father would come into the sick-room. He was always very gentle if anyone were ill. But he disturbed the atmosphere for the boy. "'Art there asleep, my darling?' Morel asked softly. "'No. Is my mother coming?' "'She's just finishing folding the clothes. Do you want anything?' Morel rarely thee'd his son. "'I don't want nothing. But how long will she be?' "'Not long, my ducky.' The father waited undecidedly on the hearth-rug for a moment or two. He felt his son did not want him. Then he went to the top of the stairs and said to his wife, "'This child's asking for thee. How long art going to be?' "'Until I've finished. Good gracious! Tell him to go to sleep.' "'She says you're to go to sleep,' the father repeated gently to Paul. "'Well, I want her to come,' insisted the boy. "'He says he can't go off till you come,' Morel called downstairs. "'Eh, dear, I shan't be long. And do stop shouting downstairs. There's the other children.' Then Morel came again and crouched before the bedroom fire. He loved a fire dearly. "'She says she won't be long,' he said. He loitered about indefinitely. The boy began to get feverish with irritation. His father's presence seemed to aggravate all his sick impatience. At last Morel, after having stood looking at his son a while, said softly, "'Good night, my darling.' "'Good night,' Paul replied, turning round in relief to be alone. Paul loved to sleep with his mother. Sleep is still most perfect, in spite of hygienist, when it is shared with a beloved. The warmth, the security and peace of soul, the other comfort from the touch of the other, knits the sleep, so that it takes the body and soul completely in its healing. Paul lay against her and slept, and got better, whilst she, always a bad sleeper, fell later on into a profound sleep that seemed to give her faith. In convalescence he would sit up in bed, see the fluffy horses feeding at the troughs in the field, scattering their hay on the trodden yellow snow, watch the miners troop home, small black figures trailing slowly in gangs across the white field. Then the night came up in dark blue vapour from the snow. In convalescence everything was wonderful. The snowflakes, suddenly arriving on the window-pane, clung there a moment like swallows, then were gone, and a drop of water was crawling down the glass. The snowflakes whirled round the corner of the house like pigeons dashing by. Away across the valley the little black train crawled doubtfully over the great whiteness. While they were so poor, the children were delighted if they could do anything to help economically. Annie and Paul and Arthur went out early in the morning in summer, looking for mushrooms, hunting through the wet grass, from which the larks were rising, for the white-skinned, wonderful naked bodies crouched secretly in the green. And if they got half a pound they felt exceedingly happy. There was the joy of finding something, the joy of accepting something straight from the hand of nature, and the joy of contributing to the family exchequer. But the most important harvest, after gleaning for frumenty, was the blackberries. 
Mrs. Morrell must buy fruit for puddings on the Saturdays. Also she liked blackberries. So Paul and Arthur scoured the coppices and woods and old quarries, so long as a blackberry was to be found, every weekend going on their search. In that region of mining villages blackberries became a comparative rarity. But Paul hunted far and wide. He loved being out in the country, among the bushes. But he also could not bear to go home to his mother empty. That, he felt, would disappoint her, and he would have died rather. "'Good gracious!' she would exclaim as the lads came in, late, and tired to death and hungry. "'Wherever have you been?' "'Well,' replied Paul, "'there wasn't any, so we went over Miss Kills. And look here, our mother!' She peeped into the basket. "'Now those are fine ones!' she exclaimed. "'And there's over two pounds! Isn't there over two pounds?' She tried the basket. "'Yes,' she answered doubtfully. Then Paul fished out a little spray. He always brought her one spray, the best he could find. "'Pretty,' she said, in a curious tone, of a woman accepting a love-token. The boy walked all day, went miles and miles, rather than own himself beaten and come home to her empty-handed. She never realized this, whilst he was young. She was a woman who waited for her children to grow up, and William occupied her chiefly. But when William went to Nottingham, and was not so much at home, the mother made a companion of Paul. The latter was unconsciously jealous of his brother, and William was jealous of him. At the same time, they were good friends. End of Part A of Chapter 4